This morning, we woke up to the news that 3,000 flights had been canceled. So when I say I'm glad to be here, you're probably feeling much the same way. It's, it's a blessing to be present together tonight. Especially because at noon, we were having a meeting to decide whether we should close the cathedral to in-person worship during the next few days. So that's the world that we live in. So even though we come to this holy place, we walk in those beautiful doors, that's the world that's just outside. And so tonight, I ask you to think about a question. How can we become more joyful? The graffiti artist Banksy has an exhibit at the Legion of Honor right now. When he was 18 years old, he spent a night trying to paint in bubble letters late again on the outside of a passenger train. When the police showed up, he, everybody scattered and he went through this thorn bush and he got badly scraped up. The rest of his friends managed to get back to the car and they just took off without him. And for over an hour, Banksy was under a dump truck hiding out with oil dripping down on his face as he listened to the police officers walking back and forth just beyond him. He was trying to think about how he might cut his painting time in half when he looked up and he saw the stenciled plate on the bottom of the fuel tank. He realized that from then on, that would be his style of art. It would be a massive version of this, like three foot high letters. Finally, he got home, he crawled into bed with his girlfriend, and he told her that he had had an epiphany. And she told him to stop taking drugs because it's bad for your heart. <laughs> Last year felt a little bit like when Banksy was escaping through the horn thorn bushes. And this year feels a lot like we're lying underneath a, a massive dump truck with oil dripping on our face. The pandemic leaves us with a question. And the question is, are we going to have an epiphany or will what happened to us just be wasted? Now, every year the cathedral has a theme, and I, I love the fact that the bishop always preaches on the theme. So I don't know if he's going to say, preach on the theme later tonight, but I'm looking forward. I'm, okay, good. Got the thumbs up from the bishop. But our theme this year is the year of healing. And we've done so much thought about how we heal our bodies over this time, and we've learned so much about how to fight the pandemic over this last year. But tonight, I want to ask you how you are healing spiritually. So for homework, sometime in the next three days, I want you to ask someone how they are healing spiritually. On this holy night, when the angels draw near, bringing great news, great joy, news of great joy, I want to consider three suggestions for living more joyfully. The first suggestion is try to stay out of your own way. A lot of people I know formed a picture of who God was when they were 10 years old. And although their views on virtually everything else have grown and changed along with them, their picture of God is the same that they had when they were 10 years old. All of us are changing and our faith has to grow along with us. We need to think of faith less in terms of believing particular propositions and more about the experience of wonder and awe at our existence and at the world. Now, not many of you probably know this, but in 2021, an extraordinary thing happened. Now, for backup information, you need to know this, that our galaxy is an obscure little galaxy. But in that obscure little galaxy, there are 100,000 million suns. So that's a little background information. And what scientists discovered just this year is that there are 10 times as many galaxies as they believed before. So they used to think that we had 200 billion galaxies, and now they believe we have 2 trillion galaxies, perhaps each one filled with 100,000 million stars. Now that's the kind of world we're talking about when we're thinking about God. Now, this probably doesn't happen to you as much as it happens to me, but I meet a lot of atheists on airplanes. <laughs> and I, I think they're always kind of disappointed. Oh my gosh, I'm sitting next to a guy with a, a PhD in theology. 
a lot of what they don't believe, I don't believe either. All of us are a strange mixture of believing and doubting. And God is trying to help us with this, but God won't make much progress if we're determined to think that there is no other God than the God we first learned about in childhood. On Christmas Eve in 2007, my friend Alan Jones spoke from this very pulpit. He talked about the controversies that were happening over Christmas crushes on public lands. Oh, for the days when we worried about things like that, huh? He said that an even more serious problem was that people were stealing the baby Jesus out of the crash. It, the matter had gotten so bad that there was a town near Chicago where they had to chain the baby Jesus into the crash so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't get stolen. And he said this. He said, being stolen is one of the hazards of being Jesus in America these days. And then he went on to say, Every time you say, happy holidays, an elf dies. <laughs> now, I don't know what he meant by the second thing, but I think the first point that Alan was trying to make is to not let our culture steal Jesus from us. The politicians, they love Jesus. They love Jesus because Jesus does well in the polls. Don't let the church either. Don't let the hypocrisy and the disorganization and all, the, all the, the self-centeredness of the church, don't let that take Jesus from you. But most of all, don't let your own cynicism, don't let your own sense that you're too sophisticated or too intelligent keep you from believing. Two, my second point. That's a three-point sermon, so I'm well along. The second point is don't avoid suffering. This probably isn't what you expected to hear in a sermon about joy, but let me explain. The strange thing about our human condition is that joy and suffering are strangely mixed up in each other. It's not as quite as simple as saying that there is no joy without suffering, but joy is also something different than happiness, and it abides, it lasts in us, it, it, it remains in us, it persists in us in a way that happiness does not. The Gospel of Luke has a very complicated vocabulary, and I can't believe it that I read the same thing all the time, and this year I noticed something I'd never seen before, and that is I noticed the Greek word agroluntes. And what it means, what it's translated for is in, your, in what we heard in the gospel that Ken just pro pro proclaimed, what we heard was there, the shepherds were in the fields. Well, in the fields is kind of like another way of saying that they were outside. So you could almost translate it as the shepherds were outside. And in a way, the whole gospel of Luke is deeply concerned about who is on the outside. The angel literally appears to the people who are the outsiders. Now, according to Luke, Jesus shows special concern for the poor. And when I say the poor, I don't just mean people who don't have any money. It also means people who are of low social status, women or children. It means people who are of a, a, a different ethnicity. It means people who are regarded as unclean because they're lepers or because of a disability. It even includes people who, through their own choice, have chosen forms of life that put them outside of decent society. Maybe they're tax collectors or Roman um, soldiers or prostitutes. These are the outsiders. And you can think of who the outsiders are today. It's probably pretty obvious to you. But these are the outsiders who Jesus invites to the banquet. Now, if you don't feel like you quite fit in this place, like if you don't know all the words, you don't know when to stand up or how to sing the songs, you fit in too. You're one of those outsiders that Jesus loved so much. Jesus, the whole story is about outsiders. Not only does Jesus invite all of them to his banquets, Jesus tells this great story about two brothers. One brother basically asks for his inheritance early, and he goes off to Las Vegas, and he blows through all the money. He comes back and asks for forgiveness from his father, and his father rushes because he, his father loves him so much. His father puts on the best robe they have, puts a ring on his finger, has a huge party for him, and the other brother is jealous. And Jesus says, that is what life is like, where for God, God is inviting everyone in. And for the people who are already feel like they're in, it's a problem. And so Jesus died because he upset this social order. 
But even on the cross, next to him, two condemned criminals. And the last thing that Jesus did alive was to say to one of them and to try to comfort him and to say to him, today you will be with me in paradise. There is nowhere outside of God's invitation. There is nothing that you can do that puts you beyond the reach of God's love. God's joy exists even in places of terrible suffering, even during a pandemic. Three, the last point. Be still. So if joy is not getting everything you want all the time, if it is not successfully avoiding suffering, then what is it? Because the book of Psalms says that we're supposed to be joyful. Psalm 100 says, be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Well, life, life is movement in time. And as we're witnessing with the Omicron variant, we are always responding to change. We always are striving to achieve our goals. And joy, joy is what happens in that moment when everything stops, where the movement becomes still. It comes when we stop trying to resist change, when we stop comparing what is happening now to how things could or should have been. But joy is more than this. Joy is when life becomes a kind of gift, a gift we could never have imagined or dreamed of. The theologian Karl Barth writes that, quote, joy is really the simplest form of gratitude. To be joyful is to expect that life will reveal itself as God's grace. Now tonight, for the first time in my life, I'm going to celebrate Christmas with, with one of my favorite families. Jackie and Woozer are here from Maui. We've, I'm always here in, 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 in San Francisco. I never see the two of you and your family um, at Christmas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And what a gift it is. I think so often of those moments. Um, Woozer, my cousin, is a poet. He's a writer. Um, every year I look forward to hearing what kind of books he's going to recommend, what music he's going to recommend. And we sit off the shore of Maui, and we're bobbing up and down, waiting for that wave to come in, and we're talking. And in that moment, there is joy, just as there is right now. How can we become more joyful? We have to stay out of our own way and not let anyone steal Jesus. Do not avoid suffering because it is mixed up in joy. Jesus invites the outsiders into paradise, even you and me. And finally, be still. Live out of prayer and gratitude. Let every heart prepare him room. Let heaven and nature sing. Let us pray. Be born in us that we may ourselves be born. Be born within us that by words and deeds of love we may share the news of your love to a world that dies for lack of love. We ask this in the name of the mother and her baby. Amen.